How's it going? Andrew here. Welcome to another edition of the Creative Endeavor podcast. In this episode, I've got quite a guest for you. I find him to be an incredibly inspiring fellow. Now, I first came across him in the movie called The Secret many years ago. And from there, I went on to read his books and even attend a couple of his seminars. I found his work was really directly applicable to my art career and helped me get ahead a little bit more. Now, I am, of course, talking about Dr. John Demartini. And not only is he a best-selling author, but he's also a renowned researcher and human behavior expert. So I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure you're gonna gain something out of it. I know I did. This is gonna be a little bit different than the normal art track that we were on before. And hopefully there's a few things that are uncovered in this conversation that you can apply to your art career directly. So with all that said, I really hope that you enjoy this edition of the Creative Endeavor podcast. Dr. Demartini, <clears throat> welcome to the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure chatting with you again. It's been a little while. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and thank you for asking. And uh, congratulations on your podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, it's a, it's a new one. So um, the reason I wanted to have you on is because, <clears throat> I, I, as I mentioned to you before while we were chatting, um, I'm having so many emails now from, from young creative professionals and artists from around the world asking me how to get ahead as an artist, as a creative professional. That question raises so many different issues and it sends me all the way back to when I first started out when I was really struggling. And one of the most profound experiences in in my young artistic career was when I was actually attending an event that you were hosting called the Breakthrough Experience. Um, I would like to go back and I'd like to share with people a little bit about that story about how we first met and the painting that I actually did for you. Do you, do you want to tell people that story? Well, you probably know as much, if not more so, because you were involved in the producing the painting. (laughs) Uh, I believe you came to an evening event also, um, around that time. Um, all I know is that I, if, if I'm an heir, you step in because I may have some, uh, missing gaps in this. All I know is that I shared a story about the time that I met Paul Bragg and the evening that I was inspired uh, to be a teacher. Mm. And I shared the vision that I saw that night. And it was um, a vision of standing out on a balcony, looking out over a giant square with a million people in it. And I was sharing, speaking. And at the time I was 17 years old and I didn't have any education. And it was uh, a completely probably a dissociative identity disorder. (laughs) I felt so ignorant that I probably, you know, grandized this vision or something. But it was definitely inspired. And and I and I I said that at a presentation. And then I believe you approached me and you made a comment that uh, be a really great idea to paint that. And uh, and so you you went out of your way uh, to capture that. And we went through a few interactions on getting that image right. Yeah. And you captured it. You captured it. It sits in my office. Your painting sits in my office as you come in. (laughs) And uh, many, many people have seen your painting and they just they'll stare at it and they'll just go, wow. That's so cool. That that, that painting captured one of the most most important moments of my life. And that's certainly it's a bit of a, a claim to fame for me. I was like, I painted Di Martini. <laughs> it's well, pretty cool. But, but the, the truth yeah. is, two very significant moments in my life. The moment I met Paul Bragg when that happened. Yeah. And then when I end up trying to go back to school, and I failed my first uh, attempt in school, hmm. and I almost gave up on pursuing what I do today. <clears throat> and my mom saw me distraught and said, you know, son, what happened? What's wrong? You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're crying. I said, mom, I, I blew the test. I, I, I guess I'll never read or write or communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. And, um, she said to me, you know, whether you become a great teacher, human philosopher, and travel around the world, whether you go back and ride big waves in Hawaii, like you've done, or whether you return to the streets and panhandle as a bum, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what. 
And when she said that, my hand went to a fist and I saw that vision that you painted again mm. for the second time. And I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading and teaching and studying and learning and traveling. And I'm going to do whatever it takes, travel to a distance and pay for a price to give my service of love. And I'm not going to let any human being on the face of the earth stop me, not even myself. And that was two defining moments. The moment I saw the vision and the moment that my mom said that allowed me to recapture the vision. And that vision didn't leave after that. So when you painted it, that was a very special painting. You know, there's there. My daughter says, uh, Dad, you know that that's mine when, when you when you croak. <laughs> <laughs> that painting's mine. She wants that. But yeah, that's a special painting. It sits right as you come in my office there. The mo- one of the most important positions. Oh, fantastic. Well, look, it was it was certainly an honor. And it was it was quite a daunting project, actually, to work on, t- to be honest. I mean, at the time, I was scared stiff. But, uh, you know, as we were talking, I was like, yeah, I got this. <laughs> but uh, Well, you know, it, but the thing is that... <clears throat> You have an eye. When I saw some of the paintings of natural landscapes that you've captured, um, I didn't believe they were paintings. I thought they were photographs. Yeah. yeah. I, I had a hard time comprehending that that was a painting. Yeah. And I was going, how in the hell does he create and capture that much detail <clears throat> about some natural habitat? And uh, and I, I was I was blown away by that. And then. And then you were able to capture the essence. I mean, you even got my fingers, my ne- my rings, my facial expression, the, the hair, the, the you got everything, and it was it was quite amazing. You even got some of the people's faces in the audience. I mean, you captured it. <laughs> I think true. you even put statues out there. I think I think I'm in that statue even. You are, yeah. And you put in you put in buildings from around the world that represented my global vision, yeah. that were from different countries. So it was a very meaningful painting, and it. I love just staring at it. So I, yeah. I, I appreciate that. That's a very meaningful experience. But it, I mean, it's interesting because when, you, when you're saying that, and thank you for, for kind comments on my work, but when you were looking at my work, that was when I was probably at my lowest. And when you were telling your story on stage about your vision, that just sparked this moment of recognition in me, just kind of thinking, I, I do have something in myself. So I, I was going through at the time, like this this kind of, Somewhat of a, I guess it might have been a unique, I thought it was a unique situation for myself, but I realize these things kind of repeat amongst people. But I was doing really well and I was successful in one respect. You know, I was accomplished with what I could do with my art. But at the same time, I was dead broke. Like I was, I was absolutely broke um, and really struggling, really stressed out and just had all sorts of physical ailments as well. And I just couldn't seem to get it together. And when I heard that story that you're telling, I thought, man, you know, what's my vision? And I, I, I didn't even think to have one. I just knew that I, I loved painting pictures. And what that event gave to me and what you're teaching in your books, and, and, and one of the most important books to me was that book, How to Make One Hell of a Profit and Still Get to Heaven. I want to talk to you about that during this podcast. But when I was doing and going through some of these exercises and listening to your message, this concept of living an inspired life and having a vision and living your vision, that was something that I thought, oh, gee whiz, you know, there's more to this thing. I was wondering if you might be able to talk to me a little bit and and tell, tell the people listening to this podcast a little bit more about what it means to live an inspired life and to live your vision. Well, every human being regardless of where they are in the in the game of life, is living by a set of priorities, a set of values. They may not be conscious but they're of them, but they're there. Whenever they happen to consciously or unconsciously uh, set objectives and goals that happen to align with what they value most, they feel they're in the zone. They feel they're on target and in tune and on, in, in time with what's, what's true for them. And when that occurs, when they set a goal that's congruent and aligned with the highest values, the blood glucose and oxygen goes into the forebrain and fills up the forebrain uh, and activates what is called the telencephalon, which is the end of the brain, the most advanced part of the brain, and activates an area called the medial prefrontal cortex, which is called the executive center. And this executive center has four basic functions, inspired vision, strategic planning, executing the plans, and self-governance. 
Mm-hmm. So the second that comes online and you're congruent, you see a foresight, a feeling of it's destined. You just see what's destined. You see a pathway in your mind. It opens up in your mind. I know how I can get there. And you have this desire to take action towards it. And you're not distracted by impulses and instincts of the amygdala in lower regions of the brain because the blood's not there. The blood's in the forebrain. And this is the key to an inspired life is sticking to priority. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions that continue to inspire you, your day fills up with low priority distractions that despire you. And so we have the responsibility to to keep asking, what is the highest priority action I can do at any moment in my life and stick to what's highest in priority? Mm -hmm. And this has to be something that's a priority not only to you as a meaning, narcissistically, but also on an altruistic level, what produces the greatest service for the world? Because fulfillment won't occur by just pure narcissism. You must have both give and take. Yeah. You have a sensory and motor side to the brain, and it takes the motor actions that serve people and the sensory actions of reward and bringing those into perfect equanimity and equilibrium to in order to create a sustainable fair exchange in the world, which keeps catalyzing expansion. So there, there's the second we tap into something that we absolutely love doing, that absolutely taps into other people's needs, then that we are re- rewarded with the abundance and we're rewarded with further inspirations and we feel grateful and we feel empowered and we, we catalyze a greater expansion of our space and time horizons and we see possibilities we never saw before. So this is so crucial to prioritize on a daily basis. This is one of the biggest secrets that any human being can master. You know, you just said something just then that, that kind of sparked a thought in me because, it, and I'm taken back to that moment because, I mean, artists are, are notoriously conflicted, flaky people. And whilst we might be doing things that really inspire us, I mean, we love to create, but at the same time, we self sabotage all the time. And so, whilst I might be caught up in the moment, you know, back then and be painting and loving that process. At the same time, I would just, I'd, I'd make this money and I'd just shed it. I'd just go back down to this base level of where I felt emotionally I could handle that, handle, you know, being broke. I knew what that was like, so I was happy to live there. So wh- why is it, though? H- how do we adopt that second part to it of, of, of providing, doing something that really, truly inspires us that we love, but then keying into that need component to this equation that it seems to be missing for most artists and creative professionals? <laughs> Well, let me use an analogy. If you do a a business transaction that involves an economic exchange and you do a service and somebody pays you less than what was agreed, you tend to get a little belligerent, narcissistic and say, hey, buddy, you owe me some money. Mm -hmm. If somebody does a transaction, let's say you get in a transaction and you deliver the service, but you felt that the service you delivered was not quite up to what you agreed then what happens is you go into altruistic mode and want to give more to make sure you've met a fair exchange. So anytime you feel that you're a little bit on the shame side, you go into altruism. Anytime you feel on the pride side, you go into narcissism. Mm -hmm. So finding an equanimity between yourself where you're not proud or shame, but just being yourself and an equity between that and other people is the secret of sustainable finances. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, you value serving people, but you also value yourself. And that's when you begin to say, you know what, I'm going to take a portion of what I've earned and I'm going to have it work for me now because I deserve it. Right. But if you feel shame and guilt, you'll end up every time you get money, you'll keep spending it. Mm-hmm. But when you actually feel enough, enough pride to balance out the shame and you're now in equanimity, you'll realize that I'm going to take a portion and set it aside. There's a law in physics in thermodynamics called entropy and the tendency from going from order to disorder. And it occurs in every aspect of our life. And if we're not organizing and prioritizing and filling our day with high priority things, entropy takes over. That's why we keep getting distractions and other things. So if you don't value yourself, the world won't value you. Entropy will take over. So I learned a long time ago that if you don't take a portion of your money and set it aside and have it work for you, uh, you will have unexpected bills always erode it. And you won't do that unless you value yourself. And you won't do it unless you value serving people, value yourself, and value what money can do. 
because money is a universal medium of value, uh, fulfillment for people. I mean, if you stop and think about it, it's the most universal medium we have. That's why it's so important to us. But if we basically start to manage money wisely and put some of it aside, uh, every time we do, we every time we get accumulated, it starts drawing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger opportunities to us. And it's, so it's an art. And, and once you understand that science of it and the art of it, um, you end up not having this destitute, desperate fall down to the bottom again. So mm. you, if you're not bringing organize, order to your finances, it ends up in disorder. Money circulates uh, in the economy from those who value at least – have the least order around it to those who value it most and has the most order around it. So you have increased your value of rewarding yourself for the service you do. And as a result of it, you've attracted greater opportunities. So for somebody just starting out and, and just thinking, okay, well, I'm going to sell my painting sculpture or my, my music or my drawings, or, you know, I'm going to start my social media and share my art with the world. What what kind of advice would you offer to a creative professional just learning to value themselves enough to just put a worth in terms of a monetary value on their work? Well, if you don't value it, uh, nothing will happen. Sure. When I started speaking, um, I really didn't have a, a knowledge of my value. And I did a little kind of a minimum wage tutoring kind of thing and did classes, and I was so grateful to have anybody even listen to me that I didn't really think about charging for it. When I went to professional school, I had to pay to, for school, and I needed about $8,000, uh, uh, no, about 9000 let's see, three, two, I needed about $12,000 a quarter to, to survive at that time. And so I said, I'm, I'm gonna have to start charging for my, my speaking services. And I put a love bowl out, <laughs> a love bowl out on the, thing when the people came in and uh, I, I slanted and stood by it as they were leaving in the evening after my talk and I got a $5 bill put in there and that was it. And I thought, well, that's not going to pay the bill. And then the next day I put suggested love donation $5 thinking that more people would put it in there. I think I got 10. Then I said suggested love donation $10 and I think I ended up with $20. And I then I said select, se selected love donation $20 and I got about a $20 bill. And finally, I got pissed off and I said, you know what, I'm doing a service. If something's not, this isn't a fair exchange. And I finally got kind of narcissistic enough to say, um, uh, it's 20 bucks. That's the fee, not a love donation. It's a fee of 20 bucks. I had $360 put in that bowl. Wow. And I thought, I went home, well, I went in my other bedroom and I just laid in this little mat and I looked up and I got tears in my eyes and I said, was well, it that simple? The world is waiting for me to value me. And that was it. From that point on, I learned that lesson. And every time I increased my value on myself, I just drew more business and higher quality business to me. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome story. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, um, you know, pe people would have read about you uh, and, and heard about you, obviously, from books like The Secret and things like that. That's when I first heard your name. Actually, I was one of those people that went straight out and bought that book and thought I would attract away and actually not taking into account the whole other side to the equation. You know, you've got attraction, and you also have repulsion and, and all of this. I one of the things as I started to do the work as I started to listen to the talks and read your books and things, I, um, I realized that there was this story, and this kind of mythology that I built up about my own life in the past. And I was wondering, maybe we could talk a little bit about that, that philosophy behind, you know, these things. Because at the time I was, I was running this, this mythology, this particular narrative that I was a victim, that, I, that things had happened to me. And, uh, you know, I came from a broken family. I was, got the crap beaten out of me in school. Um, you know, I was in and out of relationships. And it was just a pretty sad thing. I was poor me, poor me, poor me. And until I actually had an opportunity to go back and look at that, reevaluate re those situations, I wasn't actually aware of what kind of impact that would have on my art. I mean, as soon as I did that, Bam. I mean, it was just a creative explosion. It was it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. I was wondering if you, you could tell us a little bit more about your your philosophy. And, and maybe we talk a little bit about, you know, these universal principles that you, you base your, your teaching on. Well, William James, the father of modern psychology, about 1895, said that the greatest discovery of his generation is that an individual can alter their lives by altering their perceptions or attitudes of mind attitude 
And uh, there was also another principle in psychology that says it's never what happens to you, it's what you decide to do with it. You know, it's you have control over three things in life, your perceptions, your decisions, and your actions. If you change your perceptions, it will impact your decisions and it'll change your actions. So I, there, there's two fields of psychology. One is the victim model, that you're a product of your environment. And the other is that, no, you're a product of your perception of the environment. And I'm more in that area because, you know, I've done the breakthrough experience on 1,125 times. I've taught that program. Wow. And 90,000 people have attended that program. And I've had every imaginable thing that people could go through in that program. And we've turned every one of those things into thank you. And uh, so it's never what happens to you. I'm a firm believer it's not what happens to you, it's what you decide to do with it. I had a young boy that came to me and he was you know, playing the victim. Uh, young, he was probably 21 or something like that. He, and he, and he, uh, he said, you know, my mom you know, and dad, they fought. My dad left, my mom couldn't pay the bills. She ended up with a bunch of drunks. You know, they beat me. Uh, I was on the streets young. And, and then, then, my, then my mom overdosed and then my dad I never saw and he died. So I was like this vagabond and everything else. And he was just running a story. And so he's, he thought of himself as an orphan. Okay. Yeah. And I said, uh, fantastic. And he goes, what the frick's wrong with you, man? I mean, fantastic. I mean, I said, fantastic. And he goes, are you sick or something? And I said, no. He goes, well, how do you say that? And he was just not even not going anywhere. He was just angry at the world and expected the world to take care of him. Yeah. And I, I said, uh, let's go here. I'm going to show you something. And I went on my computer and I opened up the Internet and I had a little place where I had stored it. But there were 700 celebrities in different walks of life from Sir Isaac Newton to Tycho Bai to uh, Steve Jobs to Wayne Dyer, people that have done something amazing. And all of them were orphans. And so I pulled out 700 names that were orphans. I said, well, you're in this category. You're in this same, this is obviously your destiny. And he wow. looked at that. He goes, all those people that you are so famous started out like me? And I said, yeah. And he goes, whoa. <laughs> and he shifted his entire perspective. I said, so it's great. I'm, 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 I'm meeting somebody that's about to do something extraordinary in the world. So they needed the challenges like you have. The more down and out you've been, the more up and in you're going. So this is one of the greatest days of your life to, to finally realize that. And it's inspiring to meet somebody that's going to do amazing things in the world. And it changed his life. I'm telling you, that, that trajectory of his life changed that day yeah. just by that one conversation. And uh, he's doing amazing things today. Ten years later, you would never recognize that story. That story he now laughs at. And he goes, I, I played the victim. Now I'm a victor. And I think that that's the difference that people can make. And you can choose to, you know, fill your day with things that are productive or you can sit there and wallow in what's not working. It's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason I, I just like that so much is, is because I, I recognize it within my own life. And, um, I mean, I just want to take an opportunity to just remind anybody that's listening. I mean, we're we're both. I, I do hope people check out your work, but I've got no agenda behind this. I'm not making money out of the podcast, but it's more just wanting to share with people and show them that you know they absolutely can do it. I mean, I've always thought that if I could do this, that other people could do this as well. I mean, I've liked to think that I've you know pulled myself out of these things, but I've had helpers along the way. I've had you know great teachers along the way. Um, the thing is, though, is that, you know, that that is so true. And it might anger some people listening to this now go, well, how dare you? I went through some really horrific things. And my story certainly wasn't the worst, you know, that was out there, certainly not by a long shot. I mean, it's pretty run in the mill stuff being bullied, broken family, yada, yada, yada. But it's that that act of playing that sad victim story that the minute I did the work, the minute I, I stopped that, saw the blessing in it, saw the, the other side to that, saw how it was serving me, was the minute that my art went to a whole nother level. And That's so, it. you know, I, from going to broke to being the successful artist who was collected internationally and getting these amazing opportunities. And one of the things I, I wanted to share with people as well is, is you actually led me to an amazing opportunity. And, and I think I'm allowed to say what this is, um, but you'll, you'll stop me and I can, I can cut it out if I'm not. But I, I remember when you were looking at my paintings at that time and, uh, you know, as I was going through the workshop, I, um, I, 
was saying, well, what do you think, Dr. Martini? what can I do? And you said, well, you know, these, these paintings will do really well on board the ship that I live on. I was like, what the heck is that? You live on a ship? That's pretty cool. Um, and you were told me about this ship called The World, which is an amazing vessel full of some of the most incredible influential people on the planet. You know, some of these people might even say they're the elites or whatever, but these are extraordinary individuals um, who are, you know, type A personalities went from quite frequently, most of them went from nothing to having this extraordinary wealth. And they live on this ship and you have to be a resident to be on board this ship. And you led me to this amazing opportunity of being able to teach on this ship. But it was really funny because when I would mention that to some people, they said, oh, so we put in a good word for you or he made the call i'm like no you you actually at the time refused to do anything you're like here's the number you make the call i love that and i'm so glad that you made me do that or encouraged me to take that step because i never would have even asked for it so after going through that work realizing that i had a value on myself that i needed to start you know saving my money i needed to drop my story see the blessing in that to then you know not even 12 months later i'm artist residence on board this amazing vessel and getting commissions you know from extraordinary people and then it's just been one thing after another after another after another i thought well, that was so that's, cool <laughs> that, that, that's inspiring to hear i'm very grateful that, that that that's the outcome because i really believed when i saw your work that that deserved to be exposed there yeah and i didn't know what opportunities would come out of it but i just knew that they deserve to see that art yeah that people deserve to see it that's all there was to it and, and I and I thought that if I do, if I say something, I could do that. I have done that on rare occasions. But I, I think if you just sent them what you're doing, they would immediately go, yeah. I mean, they, they can see the, the, the masterpiece here. So, yeah, I, I remember walking on the, the ship there one day and you guys you had a group of people in the in the quantum lounge. And there was like 20 or so in there, maybe 25 or in there. And they're all painting. And one of them was Herbert. I yeah. think you, you remember Herbert. Yeah, yeah. He's a very accomplished man. He's one of the brightest men on the planet. Yeah. And uh, he was very inspired, and he had told me that he's very grateful to meet you. And he was painting. He was doing paintings with you. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you you inspired some people in there. But I when I looked at there, and I and I was there with Trish, I said, this is inspiring to see because, you know, you're, 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 you're in your element, and you were just there, and you were teaching, and you were – showing them and you were getting them and you could see them engaged and they were they were creating masterpiece you were building their confidence and building their own masterpieces and you can't help other people get what they want to get in life without you getting what you want in life. so it's understandable why you got opportunities that's you deserve the opportunities but it, it, it led me because i i actually hadn't thought about teaching before that you know b before i did you know the program read the books that sort of thing i hadn't even thought about doing any teaching or, or doing it I, I was just thinking you know what kind of what's in it for me? What can I paint? How can I sell this thing for top dollar and, and, and make that work? And whilst that was turned into a successful business, that underlying love for teaching, I hadn't actually discovered. And being on board, and, and I taught a few workshops before then, but that really solidified it for me. One of the things I realized, though, being amongst some of these mo the most influential people on the planet, handing them a paintbrush, I always found it so funny that it doesn't matter who you are, or what you have, you become a five-year-old the minute you have a paintbrush in your hand. And it was great. And suddenly I'm in this room of people and I'm teaching them how to paint landscapes and portraits and floral still lives. And it was it was an absolute, an amazing experience. And, you know, that, that led to a few more experiences on board. But the last one, I got to share this story with you because I don't... <laughs> I don't think you've, you've heard this one. This was the last time we were on board, uh, just uh, last August. And I'm getting ready to do a demo, and I'm going to paint a portrait. And I ask Dr. would you be my sitter for this portrait? I'm going to do a group demonstration. And he's like, of, of course. Of course, I'd love to. And so I said, great. We made the arrangements. I talked to the, the, the crew, and they, they helped put it together, and we had our date set. So the evening that I'm about to give my demo, I start arranging chairs. And this dear, you know, little old guy comes down, and he says, Andrew, stop putting out chairs. And I said, why? They told me to. He said, no, 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 no. Stop putting out chairs because when nobody shows up to this thing tonight, you're going to be really upset and you've got a lot of chairs out. So just maybe put a few of them away. Well, I, I didn't because they asked me to do so. But I thought, I was thinking, geez, no one's going to come. So 
the demonstration happens, people start showing up. I'm not paying much attention to it. I'm focusing on my sitter in front of me. And I know I've got a few voices behind me. I'm painting away. I've got the piano player in the lobby. He's trying to follow what I'm saying. There's beautiful Richard. piano music. It was gorgeous. And um, actually, it was Ramon at that time. Yeah, the, the oh, piano. Ramon. yeah. And I'm about 10 minutes in. I turn around. All the chairs are gone. And there's standing room only behind. They're crammed in like sardines. Program like walks a- through the lobby. And they look at this going, we've never seen this before. And afterwards, people were coming up, and then it was just commission after commission after commission on portraits. Um, And it was an amazing experience. That was one of the highlights of my career. Well, that's that's what I hoped for. It's it's fine to hear it. That's what I hoped for when I said call him. Yeah, yeah. And and this was the time just gone. And look, it was was amazing. I think now, though, I mean, after doing this and after doing the commission work, the thing that that's happened, the, the the love that I've discovered for teaching, that's taken precedent. And my my love for running my online business and reaching out to people through YouTube, now through this podcast, that's the thing that's really taken my priority. And that's that's where I found my passion lies. So that was such an amazing experience. And now I'm just I'm ready for the next one. So that's that was cool. But again, a real career divining moment. And look, I, I thank you for that, Dr. D. Martini. I really do, because you helped lead me down that that track. But look, let, let's get back to some of these questions because I've, I've got a whole lot of things to, to ask you. Um, because what, one of the things that, that we struggle with most, again, as creative professionals, is this thing to do with money. And I personally am struggling with something at the moment. I mean, we, we talk about saving and all of this stuff. How do, you, how do you avoid getting caught up in the economic boom and bust and turmoil and, and the, the desperation and anxiety with the current market? How do you avoid that and just stay on track, stay on mission? Oh, that's a good question. I, um, the economic market has what is called a long-term productivity cycle and a short-term credit cycle. And the short-term credit cycles are seven to 10 year cycles, productivity cycles, 75 plus years. And sometimes they, they overlap and there's a big boom or a big crunch, but there's a normal cycle because what happens is the, the fed federal reserve in each country raises the interest rates when it's overinflated. And and, I mean, it's overactive markets booming Mm -hmm. like we're doing in the U S right now. And if it goes high enough, it, it brings the market back down, calms it down, because people are afraid to borrow money and uh, to take risks and buy companies or start companies and do things. And then when it goes down too low, it, sh- it kind of crashes the market. And then when they do, they lower the interest rates to stimulate the economy again. So this cycle goes on every seven to 10 years. It's a pretty normal cycle. And so when people are on the upswing, they tend to uh, have what is called subjective bias. We hear, hear, hear it as greed and fear, greed when, it, when we're manic and fear when we're panic. But subjective bias is an amygdala response in the brain for skewing our, our interpretations of reality. And what we do is we start to we start to see a benefit, a positive thing happen, and we start to accentuate it, and we take it where it's we start to have this vicious, virtuous fantasy about oh, in the future it'll all be amazing, you know, and we get blind to the downsides. And then when it goes down, we get into a vicious cycle and we can't even see the upsides. And so the master is the one that knows that this is a cycle. And they know to concentrate on the downsides when it's racing upward. So they're not unconscious of the downsides and focus on the upsides when it looks like it's down. Now, let me give an example. Let's say you meet this girl. You're you're a single guy and you meet this beautiful girl and she's gorgeous. And you're infatuated with her. And you're blind temporarily to the downsides of her. A fatal attraction like Michael Douglas and Glenn Close. But you eventually have to discover that, oop, there's the other side. She's not what you thought. She may not even be a girl, maybe bruised. (laughs) It's just changed. (laughs) But once you find out, uh, then it goes into the other side. Now you resent the person. And now you forgot all the things that you were attracted to. And these are the subjective biases that why Warren Buffett says, until you can manage those emotions, don't ever expect to manage money. Because the second you get manic, you'll borrow money to think you're going to make a fortune, and then you'll get yourself in debt. The market has what is called a mean. 
And anytime it goes above the mean, it's overpriced. Anytime it goes below the mean, it's underpriced. And what people do is that they, when everybody's manic, it goes above the mean, and it actually it's smoke. It's just emotional exuberance. It's nothing there. Mm. Now it goes below the mean. Now there's a good buy. You can buy cheap stuff. Yeah. But what people do is when people manic, the herd instinct makes everybody buy, and they get into greed. And then when it goes down, they go into panic, and everybody goes into fear. So I follow the mean in all my investments. I follow the mean. I have electronic automated systems of investment where I don't have emotions. I don't ever pay attention to it. It's automatically electronically done because I find electronics don't have emotions. They just take the money and buy investments. And I buy, whenever it's above the mean, I stop buying. Whenever it's below the mean, I start buying. It's really simple. The mean averages in the market on a collective broad scale of the stocks, for instance, about six, 7%. But if you start to know if you calculate what the mean is, which is a very simple calculation. And anytime it starts going above the mean, you stop the buying. And anytime it goes below the mean, you start back the buying. You can now take a six or 7% interest rate yield and get it up to 10 to 12%, which means it'll double in the law of 72 every seven, six to seven years, it'll double. It means your money is just, everything's gonna double. So you just gotta be patient, put a structure in place. See, strategies build wealth and emotions destroy it. Okay. Why? Because the emotions are of the animal nature in the primitive part of the brain, and the executive center is the strategic part of the brain. And without the executive center, the human nature, you don't find animals too wealthy. You find humans wealthy. Only the ones that are able to monitor their emotions and govern their emotions. So until you can manage your emotions, don't expect to manage money. Until you put in strategies in and quit getting trying to get rich quick overnight, and just methodical patient on a long-term mean and invest in things and keep growing your knowledge and keep growing your services and keep caring about people, you're probably gonna have financial challenges. But I find that if I, like right now, since uh, I think April of uh, 2016, yeah, 2016, uh, it has been above the mean. The, the, general, uh, in, the, the general market in the United States has been above the mean. Yeah. So that's when I stopped putting it in. I've been accumulating capital in conservative investments, waiting for them to raise interest rates and waiting for a crash. Well, the crash is here. They're now having dips in the market. It's not enough to buy yet, but it's on its way because they're gonna keep raising interest rates. The second they do, once it goes below the mean, I just buy. It's not rocket science. Right. And I right. So now when everybody else is selling, that's when you buy. And uh, when everybody else is buying, that's when you, you sit steady. Right. And it's just a simple process and, and it, there's no emotion in it, it's just purely uh, mechanical, strategic, electronic structuring, and you take advantage of, of the opportunities in the market that way. Do, do you have any comments on on trying to protect your wealth? Because in a in a crash, I mean, one of the things that happens, you know, when we have a crash or, or a bust, um, there the the luxury markets seem to wobble, and so people are like, I I know people right now are online are, are looking at my work and other artists like me going, wow, you know, I want to get to that level. I want to sell my paintings for thousands. But, um, you know, what's going to happen with the market? It's going to crash and people aren't going to be able to buy my, my work. And I have actually experienced that where there'd be a fluctuation and then I would have this real dry spell, really intense dry spell. How do you get around those sorts of challenges? I mean, because there are some really real downfalls, are there, are there not? Well, no. Um, okay. <laughs> right now, I'm waiting for the crash. So I'm, I've been accumulating cash for the crash. I call it cash for the crash. So those are the opportunities. When it goes below the mean, when everybody else thinks it's a crash, people that have cash, that's the best buying time. That's the opportunity time. So I don't, I don't ever think there's a good or bad market. I, a person that knows how to manage money never sees a good or bad market. They mm -hmm. just see a market. And they know how to use the up and the downside to their advantage. Right. So the more you know, the less you concern about what goes on around you. You just put the strategy in place. Now, gold and silver, or gold at least, is a hedge against the crashes in the market because gold goes up when people are panicking. And so if you have a stock market and you have a, a hedge of gold, those things oscillate to each other. And then so when it's down with the stock market, the gold goes up and this kind of thing happens. And you hedge and that way you're evening out the volatilities. So if you structure properly, you can even out the volatilities and get a good return. And uh, so, but, but gold in itself is really as valuable as the sentiment around it, because there's no intrinsic value as far as a stock. It doesn't give dividends. It doesn't have 
uh, capital gains. It just has a price that goes up based on doomsday. If there's a doomsday, gold goes up. Hmm. So you have to wait for doomsday to see the gold price go up. But overall, in history, it goes up. You know, so th th if you just sit there on the gold for a period of time, it'll go up and down and up and down, but gradually go up the scale. But if you also know how to hedge it with it against other markets, you can use each one of those and it really doesn't matter what the market does. You know what to put your money in during that time and what to put the money in that time and you use it to your advantage. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's a good or bad market out there. I would say the master doesn't have a response from the outer world. The master puts a strategy in place using the outer world to its advantage. That's really, that's, uh, that's deep, man. <laughs> I can love I, that. Can I share a funny story? Can I share yeah, a story? Yeah, please, please, absolutely. Uh, I, uh, I was in California Oh, about 1989, 90, and had a place over the beach, three-story place over this beach. And I went to this health food store to get some carrot juice one morning after surfing. And uh, there was a guy in there talking to another guy, and I could hear him overlapping. The, I was sitting at the next little table, and I could listen to him talk. And it was deep philosophy. It's a really good philosophy, and I love philosophy. So they were talking, and I said, do you mind if I join in, you guys? And they go, oh, come on in. We started talking stuff, and it was this martial artist that was steeped in some philosophy that was discussing things. And then I, I added my two bits, and he says, well, you have background in philosophy. I said, well, I've studied all the classic philosophers, from all the pre-Socratic Greeks from Thales, Anaximander, Anaxagoras, Pythagoras, all the way through to modern. And uh, as we had some common denominator. And, and I found out he was a famous martial artist that taught a lot of the Hollywood martial arts stuff. And so I said, well, I'd love to learn some martial arts. I'd like to learn some philosophy. Let's get together. So he came over to my 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 place. And uh, he was going to teach me martial arts. And after that, I was going to teach him some philosophy, an hour for an hour. That's how we had it. <laughs> so the first thing he did is he, he bowed down to me, and I bowed down to him. And he says, and we're in the living room looking over the beach. And he says, uh, now, the first thing that you must do if you want to be a student of mine is you have to try to kill me. You have to attempt to kill me. And I thought... Well, I don't want to kill you. I have no desire to kill you. He says, well, then maybe you don't desire to be a student of mine after all. Maybe we better just end this. I said, well, I don't want to have to kill you to be a student. That doesn't make sense. If I kill you, then I can't be learning from you. He says, then you don't want to do it. I might as well go home. And he was being really firm about it. And I thought, this is bizarre. And I said, you want me to kill you? And he goes, yes, please attempt to kill me. And I'm sitting there going, well, I don't have a motive to do it. He said, well, then you don't have a, you, you can't be my student. <laughs> So I, I thought, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. Uh, so he wanted me to kill him. So I thought, okay, I'll pretend like I want to kill the guy. So I, I tried to make a punch. Uh, what, what martial arts I knew, I tried to make a punch. And as I was punching him, uh, he just mildly leaned over to the side like this, grabbed my hand, pulled it this way, pulled me off balance, twisted it, pulled me off balance really quickly, pulled me to him and he kissed me on the cheek and he put me back on my feet. And I said, okay. And he says, you didn't kill me. Please try again. And I'm okay. And this time, the tiniest bit of desire to get him came in. And I, um, I did this, this kick, this forward kick, you know. And, uh, and uh, this time, he, as I kicked him, he leaned forward, grabbed my foot, just moved off to this side now. Grabbed my foot, leaned it forward, twisted it, pulled me off balance. I was literally hopping on the other foot. And then he pulled me forward and kissed me on the cheek and put me back. And I thought, this is strange as hell. And then I tried one more back kick. And the same thing happened. I was starting to think, maybe the guy's just a gay guy who wants to kiss me on the cheek. This <laughs> guy to pick me up or something. And I thought, this is odd. And then finally, he, he sets me back on my feet. And he bows to me again. And I, I bowed to him. And he says, you did not successfully uh, kill me. And he says, no, I didn't. He says, well, let me teach you the first principle. The first principle is this. To the neophyte, the newcomer, uh, you perceive things as an attack. But to the master, you perceive an invitation to dance. Wow. So he said, no matter what you do, I know every possible thing you could throw at me. And I know how to dance with that. And I just turn it into a dance and have some graceful movements with you and be present with you. And so the more frustrated you become, the more graced I become because I'm prepared and you're not. 
He says, but as you become a master, you'll realize it has nothing to do with the outer world. It has everything to do with your preparation and your interpretation of the outer world. And that was a great teaching. Wow. Yeah, that certainly is. That certainly is. I mean, and that just goes hand in hand with what we're talking about, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Awesome. Well, still, I, uh, okay, okay, look, I'm, I'm going to, I, I swear I wasn't going to do this. I wasn't going to ask you about this stuff, but I, I, I can't. It's just, it's under the surface and I have to ask you. I sometimes get to a little bit too far down the road, you know, because when I'm painting, right, I'm not consciously thinking about what I'm painting. So I listen to audiobooks and a bit like you, I mean, I'm into philosophy, but obviously nothing at the level you're at. I'm not saying that. But, um, you know, I, I love audiobooks. I get into YouTube videos, but sometimes I find myself going down these dark roads of conspiracy theories about who runs the world and what they're doing. And that kind of ties into the economic paradigm thinking what these guys are trying to do here is what the elites are trying to do is they're trying to devalue the dollar and they're trying to take away real money. And this is going to be a, a huge transfer of wealth and it's going to take it from the, the have nots to the haves and they're going to get even richer and it's off the backs of us people. And I start getting emotional again. Um, and, and so my, my question is specifically about anybody else who might be and I know there's a few of my friends who will be listening to this as well who will be like ah oh, you had to ask him about conspiracy theories didn't you so <laughs> without getting into any specific one um you know because some people do seem to think that it is a conspiracy what's happening with monetary policy globally especially with the fed and the federal reserve act you know that it, this is something that is just not really fair so how do you how do you proceed with and and uh, how do you shed that i suppose I, i'm, I'm going to assume you have to shed that that belief i struggle well, with that uh, a little bit of knowledge makes you volatile a great deal of knowledge centers you right so what i found uh, there was a gentleman who wrote a book called the creature of jekyll island griffin edward griffin, griffin. love him yes i lectured with him I met him and I lectured with him in Mexico. At Anarcapuco? In Acapulco. Were you at Anarcapuco? Yeah. With Jeff Berwick? I don't know who else there. There was a broad of people there. Fantastic. Tell me about that. So I, I lectured with this guy and he had a heart attack that night. He had a health issue and he had to go rush to the hospital. So I had to take over his class and I read his book. And um, if you read that book, you're going to be skewed into the idea that this is a conspiracy. You know, the, they went to create Jekyll Island and this whole thing was this handful of people that are running the things and this kind of stuff. And he has a subjectively biased, skewed view of that whole process. Right. There's another book called Manic Panic and Crashes. And this is a complete opposite view of the same thing by somebody completely perceiving it from an opposite side, like a dialectic in philosophy. I encourage people to read both to get a better understanding of the, the, the Federal Reserve because you can see both sides. If you see one side, you're going to be angry. If you see the other one, you're going to be grateful. If you see both sides, you're going to understand human behavior. That every, every human being has an altruistic and a narcissistic side. And every organization has this. You know, It wants to survive. It also wants to serve. And it has to find a balance between those two. So the Federal Reserve was an absolutely essential component. It wasn't just this conspiracy. It was an absolute essential component because the gold standard that we had, there wasn't enough gold to make it available uh, without diluting it to be able to allow everybody to borrow money that they needed. So they had to go on a fiat currency in order to do that. And once they fit fiat currency, they had to put regulations in to, to oversee the various size banks because there was there's no regulation. Banks can go out of control. You've had it in your country in Australia many times where you get a little bit too loose and they have to rein it in. So this was a way of trying to keep this thing under check and to allow it to expand the monetary system, knowing that there's a probability that you might have a run on a bank and the whole thing could collapse with the house of cards uh, and they'd have to bail it out with printing and having a secret tax or that they could gamble on the idea that most people will be governed. And if they if somebody governs it, it works. It allows people to build economies. So there's benefits and drawbacks to it. Um, you know, I, I've read some of the conspiracy theories. I. You know, I've heard about the Bilderberg Group and the Illuminati and all these kind of things. 
I actually met with a gentleman who was in the Bilderberg Group in London, right. and he's been in that group for many years. Uh, he's a student of mine, actually, and he, uh, you know, he's been in 11 or 12 years. He's been in that thing, and they have meetings periodically. And he said that uh, I asked him, so what the hell is the Bilderberg Group? What do, you, what do you do? He says, we work on global issues. We're trying to solve problems. Uh, we're trying to put international policies together and things together to try to solve problems. And um, we also deserve to be, you know, take advantage of opportunities. So there's there's a combination of narcissism and there's a combination of altruism in there. And he says, and there's some things we can't tell because we're having to deal with terrorist organizations and you have to have to deal with te- counter terrorist structures to solve problems. And so people that are not aware, they, they make all kinds of stories and exaggerate with these subjective biases and say, we save the world and we also destroy the world. He said, but I just, I'm, we're just trying to help people and also make sure we get ahead. And uh, it, was, it was realistic. It wasn't some polarized perspective. And I personally, I've been, I've been in 140 countries and I never had a problem going into a country, doing my business, having a, a meeting amazing people, uh, serving people, getting compensated. I've never seen anything conspire against me so far in all the travels I've been around the world. I mean, I even went into Tehran and, and the government there when they were sanctioned. I've been in countries where you rarely go uh, and where there's even terrorist stuff going on. Hmm. I was in the middle of a, a, a Nicaragua and El Salvadorian things back in the 70s and saw stuff. And and all it was is an area that CNN was filming in. And it's about an eight block area. The rest of it was normal. So we sometimes see sensationalism on TV. Yeah. And I think the conspiracists, the benefit of the conspiracists is they make us aware of things, but sometimes they, they are subjectively biased and they're just not aware themselves. So I say read it, put it into context, try to find the counterbalancing uh, content to balance it, see it for what it is, grow and expand your awareness. But by God, if you have time to be spending a lot of time on that instead of serving people, why not serve? I'd rather go out and serve and become empowered and make a difference. Any area of your life you're not empowered in, people are going to overpower you in. Mm. But I frankly have not felt in any way hindered in my life in the fulfillment of my dreams by anything on the outside. I don't see anything blocking me. I travel. I'm, I, I'm here. I go to Los Angeles tomorrow. And Monday I go to London. And the following Monday I'm in Joburg and Cape Town. And then the following Monday I'm in Las Vegas. Next Monday I'm in, in Tokyo. I've never had a problem going anywhere, doing anything I wanted living the life I've wanted. I've never had any conspiracy things stop me. But many of the disempowered people that want to blame things instead of getting getting focused, prioritized, focus on serving people and empowering your life, I don't find those people ever have a problem with these so-called people controlling them. Yeah, it's interesting because what with that explanation, brilliant, um, it's kind of reminding me that there's still an element in there of, of that old self that um, you know I need to become a little bit more... Well, the more empowered you are, you, you, the more empowered you are, the less you'd be concerned about that. I, I mean, yeah, I've read a lot of those things, and and uh, they've been around. They're not new. They've been around for decades and decades and decades. I, I, I got to actually uh, consult with some of the Rothschild uh, clan, right? And uh, and they were just people. They're just human beings. They're trying to get ahead. They've got problems with their kids, and they're you know, trying to manage things and they've got issues with relationships. They're just human beings. Yeah. And sometimes people make them into these monsters, but they're just human beings. I, 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 I'd rather, instead of labeling people, it's wiser to get to know people. Absolutely. Absolutely. But why? no, I'm not going to ask that. I'm not going to ask that next question because it's silly. That I, I, will take I, us. I got something I want to share if I, if I have time. Yeah, no, no, please. Yeah, we, I, well, this, I got time is, if you do. Yeah. Okay. This is a, this is a, this is um, Abe Lincoln. Okay, a story about Abe Lincoln. Yeah, cool. I don't know if it's true or not. It's just something I read. But Abe Lincoln was at a social function and um, round table, black tie, hundreds of people, elegant, you know, black tie affair. Everybody's in evening gowns and things. And they they ding-a-ling-a-ling, right, you know? Mm-hmm. Sometime it's time for Abe to come do a speech. <laughs> he comes up, they introduce the president of the United States. And then as he looks out, he looks across the audience and everybody's just paused, silent, waiting for him to speak. And then he points his finger at, at a guy, some guy out in the audience. I don't know if it was even to a one person, but there were probably people thought it must be going to me. And he pointed it. 
And he says, I don't like this man. I despise this man, in fact. He's a scoundrel, evil man to the core. And the whole room divides up and they look at where they think he's pointing and they're, they're moving their chairs and half agreeing with him and the other are like, what? This is a fine man, how can they do it? And he waited until the entire room was divided equally between supporters and challengers of the person that they thought he was pointing to. And once the room was completely divided into supporters and challengers that he's trying to make a point to, he finishes his statement because the, the corruption took over the next few minutes. And he says, it just goes to show that I don't know this man. For when I get to know this man, I'm certain I will love him. Wow, yeah. And uh, it was a really cool message because it, it showed the populace how easy it is to get subjectively biased and take a side and want to fight on a side instead of find the center and love. And he was trying to make a point, and he, I think he made a good point. Oh, awesome. the, 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 the conspiracy constructs are usually subjected bias. I always say that the narrower the mind, the more emotional the reactions. The broader the mind, the more un unconditionally loving the, the thoughts. And so we have to broaden our mind and see the bigger picture. When astronauts go into space, they have the overview effect, and they fall in love with Earth. Mm. But when they come down on Earth, they see all these boundaries and all these cultures and beliefs and everything else, and they're all in these conflicts. So I always say that the, we have to expand our awareness and see both sides. And, and if you point the finger out at somebody, if you look carefully, the only reason it, it reminds you of something that you're upset about is it's reminding you of a part of you that you're too humble or too proud to admit you have. I always found out, I went through the Oxford Dictionary, I went through 4,628 different behavioral traits, circled them all in the dictionary, page by page, <clears throat> wrote out to the left or right of the page, who is it that I know that has the most extreme display of that trait? Put their name there. And then I went by page by page, trait by trait, took me months and go, where and when do I display and demonstrate this trait action in action in my life? Who do I do it? And who sees me do this until I own what I saw in them? And I had, I was honest and dishonest and kind and cruel and giving and taking and stingy and generous and, and nice and mean and considerate and inconsiderate and loud and boisterous and soft. I was assertive and confident and weak and frightened. I found every one of those traits inside me as a human being. And that allowed me to realize that everybody's got every trait. Who am I to be to, to project? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, if we got time for just a couple more, I've got a couple of, uh, of um, uh, questions here that have been emailed to me by various students from around the place. So I don't have any names here to attribute these questions to. It was just general questions from, from some, some of my subscribers. Um, now, in no particular order, but I, I've, often, I've found that some of these questions reflect some of the things that I've gone through. Um, these are struggles and pain points that, that people have. And this person struggling with getting started and fear of failing. I've been told that I'm a good painter, but I look at my work and I never seem to be happy with the end result. And so they're really obviously having a problem with just getting started and just worried that they're going to suck and fail at this thing. Okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, fear, phobia, is a perception that you're about to experience in the future through your senses or imagination, more negatives than positives, more loss than gain, more pain than pleasure. And it is a compensation for holding on to a fantasy that life's supposed to give you positives without negatives, gains without losses, pleasures without pains. So as long as you hold on to a fantasy about how people are supposed to respond, the more devastated you'll be and you'll immobilize yourself from your actions. You're not here to be, you know, living in praise about it. You're here to master painting. And if you focus on master the painting, uh, you will always have praises and reprimands. I'm sure you've been into a gallery many times and you looked at some paintings, and no matter how hard you tied, you just didn't identify with them. You thought, what the hell is this? Oh, yeah. And other times you looked at them and you go, man, this is amazing. Yeah. I'm sure you've had them every, at, at, at galleries. Hmm. So you're, you cannot please everybody because they're a complete complementary opposite value systems in society. So if you have any objective or any uh, 
fantasy of trying to make everybody like you, you will undermine your potential to go out and make a difference in the world. You're gonna, you, you, there's no way you can get everybody to like what you do. So you have to set realistic expectations. If you set a realistic objective that know that you'll have people liking, you'll have to give people, they'll be able to give critiques, uh, they'll give everything imaginable. You gotta be able to embrace the whole spectrum to not be distracted and hold on to a fantasy of being liked. And then you have to go and look at if their opinion is more important than your own in this painting, then you're subordinating to them and injecting some of their values into your painting and not creating original expression. So if you, you have to be able to get so present in the executive center of the brain with your paintings that you're oblivious to those type of responses. Because if you, you know, it's like public speaking. If you stand in front of a group of people, uh, I have people that say, I'm frightened of speaking. I say, oh, really? So imagine I'm going to take you to a nursery where there's nothing but babies there, just living in little uh, bassinets. You frightened of speaking there? You go, no. What about kindergarten class? There? No. First grade? No. Fifth grade? No. Sixth grade? No. High school? No. What if I take you to a college amphitheater? Ooh, I feel anxious. The second you perceive that the one of the people in that auditorium, or many, are either more intelligent than you, more achieving than you in success in business, more wealthy than you, more stable in relationship than you, more socially savvy than you, more physically fit or beautiful than you, or more inspired than you, you're immediately going to minimize yourself to them because you're comparing your yourself to others instead of comparing your daily actions of mastery of your skill to the mission you're on. Anytime you kind of get a handle of yourself and you start following along, it, it's good to have these reminders, you know? So just in having the opportunity to talk to you again and connect with you again, um, I, I, I am reminded of, of this stuff and I, I, I'm realizing that there's some things that I need to brush up on and become a little more present. But uh, on that note, when I do commissioned work for other people, for instance, and I'm no longer present, but I'm trying to be in the head of my buyers, that's when I'm not really creating my authentic work. But when I'm teaching, when I'm when I'm teaching somebody how, the principles of painting and how to master painting, I I suddenly start thinking, what would I love to paint? And that's when I get really centered and present. And it's a completely different experience for me. Well, you're, you're also because they're looking up to you as the authority. You're you're you know they wouldn't be there if you weren't the one that knew. So that also puts you in a position where you allow the original thinking to come. We're not here to compare ourselves to others. We're here to compare our actions to our, our own visions. Yeah. I tell people that, and I had a lady that was having difficulty speaking, and I, I said, okay, stop right here. And I did it right on stage in front of the audience. I said, stop right here. You're having hesitancy. You're having fear. Look in this audience. Let's go person by person, and let's find out who in here are you intimidated by. And she went around, and it was only two people have a, a large audience, only two. Wow. And, and she found, we found the two people. I said, what specific trait action in action does this person display that you perceive that you're too humble to admit that you have it? And she said, this lady I think has more confidence and more experience as a leader than I do. Great. And I right on the spot, I said, so let's go through moments when you've been a leader and you've demonstrated incredible confidence. And I made her just go through there and stack up the memories of each one of those. This took about 20 minutes. And I just had her go through there until she got a tear in the eye. And I said, do you now see that you own what you see in her? You're no longer too humble to admit it. You see it. She goes, yep. I said, who's next? What other thing? Okay, this other lady. What's about her? She looks like she's got success in business and she's put herself together and she's just professional looking. I said, let's go. Identify where you have that in your business and in your, and in your appearance and things. And we did the same thing. We found out in her form, according to her values, where that equivalent was. We leveled the playing field. The moment she did, she had another tear. And then she looked out and she goes, and she said, I'm ready. And she did this incredible presentation without fearing what people thought, because she was no longer judging the people. She was focused on her mission of, set, of, of sharing the message. If you have four times the amount of message, something to say, than the time allotted, you will never hesitate. You'll never, um, uh, 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 you'll just speak. Yeah. And if you have four times the experience in painting than what's required for that presentation, you'll just present. That's it. That's it. Dead set. I wish we had four times the amount of time. Can I squeeze in one more question? 
Sure. Okay. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Um, this one might be slightly related because this uh, person is talking about um, artist block. Um, am I good enough or am I wasting my time? So I guess that's part of the fear of failure as well. Um, yeah. So we, we might leave that one. Here's somebody. Okay. How about this? How about this? I'd like to say something about that. Sure. Go for you it. Learn, yeah. you learn to play the flute by playing the flute. Yeah. Yeah. So if you keep painting, you know, it, it, I, I like it this way. People say, you know, oh, Dr. Martini, you're a success. I never think of myself as a success. I just think of myself as a man on a mission. But they say things like that. And uh, and then I'll say, okay, uh, I, all I am is a guy that's been for 45 years researching, writing, traveling, teaching. And, um, you know, if you stay with something long enough, eventually everybody dies out. You end up at the top. You just got to stay with it. <laughs> just don't give up on it. Perseverance, as Einstein said. Don't give up. Stay with it. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, look, um, one, one last one. One last one. Let's see if we just cram this one in here. Motivation and discipline to utilize the time that I have. Uh, this is an interesting one because when I when I think about you and I'm reading your stuff and when I have the opportunity to talk to you, when after we're done talking, I'm like, man, that's one inspired guy, you know. And I'm inspired, and I I have people tell me that, and I'm very grateful for that. But it's it, I, and I often think about this difference between, you know, and and I get this in email, which I find so weird. It's like, how do you stay motivated? Motivation never actually crosses my mind. I'm not motivated at all. And I was wondering if you might be able to talk, because I think I originally got that from you. Um, yes. Yeah. I, 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 you have a hierarchy of values. Whenever you're doing actions that are aligned and congruent with what's truly highest on your value, you are spontaneously inspired from within to act. It's an intrinsic value, and you never need to be reminded to do it. You take a boy who loves video games, and it's his highest value. You never have to remind him, motivate him, or incentivize him to do his video games. But you'll have to motivate him, incentivize and remind him to do his chores and homework because that he is not inspiring to him. So motivation is a symptom, never a solution. It's a symptom of trying to push yourself against what you really would love to do. And you're doing it with punishment if you don't do it, reward if you do, which is the most primitive form of motivation. In a company, the greater the degree of motivation required, the denser the company. And the greater the degree of lightness and inspiration, the more the company appreciates. It was uh, Peter Lynch who wrote a book on One Up on Wall Street. And he was one of the great uh, stock pickers and stock broker, not well, stock selectors, you know, analysts and things. And he did really well for Fidelity many years ago. And uh, they asked him, you know, how does he pick these great stocks and do so well? And he says, well, I do my technical analysis and I do my, you know, uh, physics and stuff on the markets and I figure out I look at the fundamentals of the, the the value of the company and I go this company is a potential company he says but I never buy the company until I actually go visit the company and when I go visit the company I want to go to the headquarters and then I want to go to some branches and visit some of the branches to see what's actually going on because on paper is one thing it's another to see the people and he says if I don't see four things I don't buy the company if people are grateful for their job they're not loving what they do. They're not inspired by the vision and not enthusiastically working where it's buzzing. I don't buy the company. Wow. There has to be engagement, intrinsic value, and intrinsic drive, inspiration to have something go up in power. We've all been to restaurants or department stores where a, a, a person who's a salesperson was totally uninspired and were preoccupied with something. You, you sit and you just want to walk out. And you've also been to those same things when you walk in and you finally found somebody that absolutely loved what they do and their life revolved around it and they were great. You want to do business there. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it, it kind of begs the question, why on earth would somebody need to be motivated to paint? Shouldn't you love to do that? So what do you think that's well, a sign of? If, if you're having to be motivated to paint, there's a number of factors there. Either it's not really what you're inspired by in your life and you have to face that or some of the components of the painting hasn't been delegated. I have people that say, I love business. I just don't like half the shit that I go through in the business, the administrative stuff. Yeah. That's spiritual harmonizing intelligent truth. That was an acronym. Yeah, no, 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 no. But what happened was I said, well, if you don't delegate it, you'll be burned out in your own business. 
So I had a guy this weekend at the Breakthrough Experience program that said that I love business, but I don't love parts of it. I said, delegate it. Get a specialist in there that loves doing that yep. and free yourself up to do it. And he goes, done. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise you'll start to think, I don't love my business anymore. The truth is you love business. You don't love all the components of it. Yeah. I, I love researching, writing, traveling, and teaching. I put in teams underneath me to do the rest, and I just do what I do best, and I'm inspired by doing it. If I had to do everything that went on in my business, I'd be bogged down. I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, you could do what I did, and that's uh, marry somebody who's really great at the business side of things, and that's her desk behind me. So, uh... <laughs> Well, you know, they, they say a man becomes a man when he comes to appreciate the intuitive qualities of a woman. Yeah. And uh, when I'm speaking to women's groups, a woman becomes a woman when she comes to appreciate. Uh, hmm. Oh, come on. Think... Come <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Martini, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. And um, any last thoughts or comments you want to leave with people, maybe where they can find out more about you? Well, you can go to my website, drdmartini.com, D-R-D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. And um, the only last statement I'll say is that uh, you want to say to yourself on a daily basis, I now give myself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth. I now give myself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth. It is impossible for me not to fulfill my destiny. It's my destiny. That's it. Now, I really hope that you've enjoyed this edition of the Creative Endeavor podcast. And if you did, then make sure you hit that like button for me and even leave me a comment in the comment section down below. Now, I'm going to put a link to Dr. John Martini in the description below as well. So make sure you click on that and you can find out more about where he's speaking, perhaps in a city near you. And also you can see some of his books there and some of them are even available as an audio version. Personally, my favorite is his book called How to Make One Hell of a Profit and Still Get to Heaven. The title's a bit of a mouthful, but in that book are some profound lessons that personally helped me work out my relationship with money. And the minute that I did that, was a minute that I saw some major leaps forward within my career. Now, if you're not already subscribed to this channel, then hit that subscribe button and check the bell icon as well so you're notified when I upload another video. I'm gonna keep uploading some of these podcasts for you in the coming weeks in between some of my more regular how to paint tutorials. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, but also, most important, subscribe through my website at www.andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for stopping by. I'll see you again soon.